In this video, we're going to be making the AI for our enemy. Let's get into it. So let's begin by creating an object for our enemy. Let's right click in the hierarchy, go 3D object and then select capsule. Let's go to the scene view. Let's right click on the transform and hit reset. Let's move this over to near the end of the bridge. Now I don't want the graphics to sit on this object. So let's just remove the mesh renderer and the mesh filter. And let's instead right click, go 3D object and then cube. And this will be our temporary graphics. So we can remove the collider on this one. We can bump up the Y scale to two and down the scale on the X and Z to something like 0.6. So now it has somewhat the dimensions of a character. Let's rename this object to graphics and rename the parent object to enemy. We'll also open up the capsule collider here. Let's change the radius to something like 0.3 and we'll leave the height at two. Let's also select our graphics object and move it up by say one on the Y, just to make sure that the pivot of our parent object will be at the bottom. And let's now also offset our capsule collider the same way. Cool, we then wanna go ahead and add our nav mesh agent. Let's just move this to the top here. Let's collapse the capsule collider and open up the nav mesh agent. And you can see now the collision cylinder that it creates. Here we want to set the speed to something like two, the acceleration, bump that up to something around 20. Let's set the stopping distance to two as well. And we can set the radius for obstacle avoidance to around say 0.2. If you're confused about what a lot of this stuff does, I recommend watching the first video in the series. Let's now collapse this as well. And let's finally add a rigid body on top. Here we just want to make sure to check is kinematic. And now our enemy has all of the necessary components in order for us to apply movement on top. So let's just drag him down to stand somewhat on the ground. Let's then go under our scripts. Let's create a new folder here. And let's call this controllers. And here we can put all of our controller scripts. So let's take our camera controller, our player controller, and let's also take our player motor since these are connected. Let's drag them under the folder and let's right click, hit create, C sharp script. And now we can add an enemy controller as well. Let's make sure to drag this onto our enemy object and let's open it up in Visual Studio. Now, the first thing that we want to do here is to define a look radius because we only want enemies to chase and attack us if we are within a certain range. So let's create a public float and let's call it look radius. And we can just default this to 10. Let's also make sure to display this in the editor by going void on draw gizmos selected. In here, we'll set the color of the gizmo to color.red. And we then go gizmos.draw wire sphere in order to draw a sphere around our current position with a radius of look radius. So if we save this, we should now be able to visually see the look radius of our enemy in the editor. So in this case, if we were to move onto the bridge, we'd be detected by the enemy. Of course, in order for our enemy to check whether or not we're within range, we need a reference from our enemy to our player. To do that, let's go in here and create a transform target. And we'll also need a reference to our nav mesh agent in order to move our enemy. Remember, whenever we're using AI inside of Unity, we have to include the Unity engine.ai namespace. And now we can create a reference to our nav mesh agent. And let's just call it agent. We can set these references in the start method. We can set agent equal to get component of type nav mesh agent to find the component on our game object. But how do we find our player? Well, of course we could use game object dot find object with tag, but then we'd have to search through all of the objects in our scene. And we don't want to go through and manually reference our player for every enemy. Instead, let's set up a script that will always keep track of our player. To do that, let's right click under scripts, go create C sharp script, and we'll call this the player manager. And we can just have this sit under our game manager. Let's open up the script. And the first thing we want to do is create a simple singleton pattern. We'll do this in the exact same way that we've done it before. And as always, if you want to learn more about singletons, there's a link in the description. So I'm just going to wrap this in a region called singleton. I'm going to create a public static player manager called instance. And then inside of the awake method, I'm going to set instance equal to this. Now we can collapse this and we can create here a public game object, which will reference our player. So if we save this, we can just go into Unity and drag our player object into this slot. We're doing it this way because we are not currently instantiating the player at runtime. However, many games spawn in the player while running. If that's the case, just make sure to update this variable to point to the player you spawn. Now we can really easily go into our enemy controller and set target equal to our player manager dot instance dot player. 
And of course, this is of type game object, so we have to convert it to a transform. Then the update method, we can get the distance from our enemy to our player. We can create a float called distance and set it equal to vector3.distance between our target's position and our position. We then check if distance is less than or equal to our look radius. Well, then we want to start chasing the player. So we can use agent.setDestination and feed it our target's position. If we now save this and go into Unity, let's take our interactable on the bridge here and disable it. Let's make sure we can see both the game and the scene view. Let's select our enemy and hit play. And you can see now that if we get closer to our enemy, it starts to chase us. Awesome! One thing that you'll also notice is that if it gets close enough in order to stop and we then run around it, it's not going to update its rotation. So it won't be pointing towards us unless we move away. Now this might be fine as long as we are using a white cube, but when we start using an actual skeleton that is going to try and attack us, we don't want it to attack out in thin air. To change this we use the same method we did for our player when pointing towards interactables. That is first off checking if the distance is less than or equal to the stopping distance of our agent. If it is, well then we actually want to go ahead and attack the target and we also want to make sure to face the target. We'll be handing attacking in the next video, but we can at least make sure to face the target. To do that, we'll create a method called face target. And we did this exact same thing in video number two on interaction. So I'm just gonna quickly do it again here. First, we get a direction to the target. We then get a rotation where we point to that target. And we then update our own rotation to point in this direction. But it's probably a good idea to apply a bit of smoothing here. So we'll be using quaternion.slurp in order to spherically interpolate between our current rotation, so transform.rotation, and our target rotation, which is look rotation. And we'll do this over time.delta time multiplied with, say, 5. If we then make sure to call the method up here, so face target, save it and hit play, we should see that no matter how we move, our enemy will always point towards us. But we also want to be able to interact with our enemy. To do that, let's go to our scripts and go create c -sharp script enemy. And we'll of course drag this onto the enemy. Let's open it up. We'll make sure to derive enemy from interactable. And we'll then go in and override our interact method. So whenever we interact with our enemy, we want to attack it. But that's again for the next video. You can see now that we have our interaction radius. Let's just set that to 4. We can also add some stats to our enemy. To do that, let's right click on our stats folder, go create c -sharp script. And let's call this the enemy stats. Again, of course, we'll add this to our enemy object. Let's again delete our two methods. And this time we want to derive from our character stats. Now, the only thing that we want to change here is how we die. So let's create a public override void for the die method. And here we probably want to display some kind of cold death animation or turn into a ragdoll. So add ragdoll effect slash death animation. And then we want to destroy the game object. So we'll call destroy game object. This would also be a good place to add loot. Let's save this, go into Unity, and we can now set a max health of say 40, a base value for the damage of say five, and let's also give it three armor. That's pretty much all of the systems that we need for enemy AI. You can see that it will follow us around. And if we right click it, we are going to interact with it. Really nice job making it this far into the series. Pretty much the only thing left gameplay wise is combat. I can't wait. That's pretty much it for this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so don't miss a future one. Also, some of you were a bit confused in the description of the last video. I understand why we are juggling videos between two different channels. So I've gone ahead and compiled a playlist. It has all the videos on my channel and all of the graphics integration on Sebastian's channel. I'll have a link for that in the description. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in August and a special thanks to Hans Hoftun, Jesper Mikkelsen, Thomas Worley, Stone Gamer, Cyborg Mummy, Jason Latif, Derek Heemskirk, Faisal Marify, Husam Kaza, Judaman, Aaron, Robert Bund, and Peter Locke. If your name's not on the list, I will make sure to include it in videos later this month and the next month as well. You guys rock!